Perfect. Well, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Today, we are honored to host Dr. John Patton III. Dr. Patton received, uh, graduated from UC Irvine School of Medicine with a dual MD MBA degree and completed his intern year at UC Irvine in preliminary medicine. He then completed his anesthesia re residency at Stanford and a regional anesthesiology and acute pain medicine fellowship at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Patton currently serves as an assistant, assistant clinical professor at UCLA in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine. Dr. Patton's goal is to leverage his MBA, leadership skills, and healthcare background to actively participate in efforts focusing on healthcare cost containment, the evolution of medical education, and redefining value in healthcare. He is passionate about organ organizational management, technology, and innovation, and big data. In addition, John is very involved in mentorship and believes strongly in ensuring that one's gifts, talents, and successes are used to help the disadvantaged and or the next generation recognize their full potential. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Patton. No problem. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So at this time, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Patton or if they'd like to share a bit about themselves in the chat, we'd love to see that. While we're while we're waiting for that, I can also share a little bit more about myself. Thanks for thanks for um, sharing my bio. So, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. I'm um, currently in LA right now, so everything kind of came full circle for me. Uh, I'm the oldest of four. My mom and dad came from humble beginnings. Both are, are professionals. My dad is a lawyer. Uh, my mom is a psychologist. She went back for her PsyD after having four kids and she completed her doctorate in her forties and really got started, um, you know, kind of forties and fifties. So, um, a lot of, a lot of hardworking individuals in my family, my grandmother, uh, built private schools out in South central Los Angeles. And that's kind of where I got my start. Um, she was a nurse. Uh, my grandfather was a surgeon who came on a boat from Trinidad with really not much in his pockets, but his faith and um, ended up becoming a surgeon, attended Loma Linda and served in the army and, and practiced down in, in, in Texas. So um, for me, when we talk about uh, outreach, working in the community, disadvantages, uh, health disparities and whatnot, that, that's stuff that's near and dear to my heart because my community, um, you know, my, my, my resume, my CV uh, obviously lists some very, um, well-known institutions where I've been blessed to be able to train and practice. Um, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm from the middle class, so I'm not trying to give the impression that I'm from a lower socioeconomic group. But that being said, um, you know, I know I know what it's like to come from an area that has has some disadvantages. And so um, I went to grade school in public schools. Um, I ended up going to high school, Beverly Hills High School, but we didn't live in Beverly Hills. There was a program that allowed for me to go there because I did well in grade school. And they have had enough seats. Uh, they had more seats than they had students in their actual district. And so there were a number of us that were able to test our way in, quote unquote. That program actually doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. So that's that's that was just my mom and dad figuring out ways to sort of help give us the best opportunities that they could. Um, and so I went from Beverly Hills High School where I got, I did very well through grade school. And I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but I'm just trying to put things in perspective. It wasn't until my senior year, you can probably, I, I blame senioritis, <laughs> where I got my first B, which is like a B plus, but, or B something, I don't know. Uh, but I took honors and AP classes, ended up getting into UC Irvine, didn't get into UCLA, which I really wanted to. I applied, I, I sent an appeal letter and still didn't get into UCLA, um, but went down to Irvine. I'm glad I ended up down there. Um, but I actually started off, um, things were really hard. Um I don't know if it was the adjustment. There were some family things going on. My mom and dad were going through a divorce. Um, just me not being mature enough to really understand what I needed to do to be successful. But I actually got my first failure um, ever in my life in, the, in that bio class my freshman year. And I didn't do much better in my second year either, in my sophomore year. And so counselors, um, I met with counselors. Um, there were some discussions about you know, academic probation, potentially, maybe, you know, considering changing my major, because they didn't think that I had what it took to become a doctor, basically saying that my odds were going to be very slim because of my, uh, my initial, um, my start, uh, you know, being being unsuccessful. And at the UC schools, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there are a number of people who come in pre-med. So, um, the first couple of years, there's a lot of discussion and talk about how in the beginning, there's a lot of students who are going to start pre-med, but by the end, there's going to be many who do not finish because of the weeding out of, of students. And so I didn't want to hear that. 
I didn't want to hear from counselor that, you know, didn't want to give me options to figure out how I can get to the end goal. They were basically just trying to use statistics to try and get me to change my major and give up on, on my dreams. So I didn't do that. Um, because of that experience, I really didn't go back to the guidance counselors and actually get any um, advice from them, which was stubborn, probably not the best approach. But again, I didn't really have anyone telling me kind of how to navigate this space. Um, and so um, I ended up finishing with the bio degree. I went all the way through. Um, I did much better towards the end. But because of that start, my actual GPA was like right around a 3.0. 3, 3 and so, you know, obviously, when you're taking a major that has a lot of units, which bio did, uh, there were 150, I believe, uh, units that were required to be to, to finish a bio major at UC Irvine. And then some of the other majors, for example, were only like 80, which is why a lot of people were able to double major. Let's say you do, do crim and poli sci, you know, or crim and social, social, uh, psych and social behavior, or something like that. You can double major and get the same number of units that I that it takes to be a bio major at Irvine. So you can imagine when you start off and you, you have a rocky start, even if you do better towards the end, which a lot of programs like to see, you know, you face some adversity in the beginning and maybe you did much better back then. It's still really hard to really get your GPA up very high. Of course, me graduating. Um, you know, I graduated from Irvine. I, I did a whole bunch of stuff there. I was fairly active, involved in various different things. Um, and I ended up taking the MCAT. Again, I didn't really talk to people about kind of what I should do. I just figured, you know what, I want to be a physician. I was working for uh, uh, some community docs um, that have practices out in West Hollywood and, and West LA area. And you know, I, I realized because I graduated thinking that I wanted to go in the business side of medicine. I was trying, I wanted to also obtain a minor in management, which was also challenging at the time because that's a high, it was a high demand thing. A lot of people wanted that minor. And me coming from the school of biological sciences, I didn't have priority in terms of being able to get those classes. So I did take some, but I wasn't able to get enough to finish and I didn't want to stay forever, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, I graduated and I thought I was going to go into the business side of medicine. But then I graduated during the last economic downturn, which is 08, 09. Um, we're in currently one right now, but 08 and 09 was the last big one back with the housing bubble crash and uh, housing market crash, sorry, the bubble burst. And um, so I ended up working for, for that those physicians that I mentioned in the community and just trying to figure things out, went back home for a little bit. And I realized from working with them, I was like, you know what, like this medicine thing, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. How do I get there? I, I don't know. Um, so I took the MCAT. Uh, probably shouldn't have just taken the MCAT. I mean, I studied, I, my, my mom and, and, you know, put some money together and we talked about it and I was able to take a prep course, but um, I took the MCAT and I did okay. I mean, I didn't do great, but I did okay. I was like, okay, I took the MCAT, now what? And I reached out um, to a buddy of mine who was a medical student who came by way of community college. He played basketball at UC Irvine. He ended up becoming a medical student at UC Irvine. He's one guy that I that I don't talk to a whole lot now, but I talked to a lot back then. I actually should reach out to him and see how he's doing. But um, he basically opened my eyes to the different options that I would have for me, you know, the different paths that I could that I could potentially go down to end up ultimately becoming a physician. I didn't know anything about post backs, didn't know anything about master's programs, didn't know anything about a lot of different things. I thought you just go to high school, you go to college, you go to medical school. That's that's what I thought. Um, and there was no real, like, I mean, social media was just getting started. I mean, kind of dating myself, but we, we, you know, Facebook was just getting going. There was MySpace and stuff like that, but there wasn't like, you know, the, the, the information that the access to information that we have now with these phones and how powerful the devices are. It's just a completely different level. Now, obviously this, this group and what you're all able to do in the network and community you have, there were things like this, but a lot of it was like in person, who do you know, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so, um, and online resources. And so. I ended up talking to him. He introduced me to uh, someone who was involved in uh, academic affairs at UC Irvine, who introduced me to uh, someone who was involved in medical affairs. That was academic affairs for the undergraduate uh, school. And who brought, introduced me to someone who was involved in medical school, who both basically African-American guy and Latino-American guy, both had desires to try and figure out how we can get more black and brown folks into medicine. And so they met me and um, they were like, you know, basically mentoring me and trying to help me figure out what my options are. From there, I met the Dean of Admissions, who's no longer our Dean of Admissions at the medical school, Dr. Peterson, uh, just a fantastic human being. Uh, she was an athlete, so she really loved athletes, um, really was passionate about trying to do something about diversity in medicine. Um, 
she, I guess, saw something in me. I was very transparent, let her know all about me. She knew all about me. She knew what I, how I did in, in um, undergrad. She knew how I did in my MCAT. I didn't hide anything from her because at that point, you know, I don't have anything else to lose. Um, and, you know, obviously humility goes a long way in terms of trying to figure out how people can, can help you. And um, she ended up introducing me to the, the idea of uh, pursuing a post back program. And so I ended up applying to the consortium, the UC consortium, um, which is the postback program for, for, you know, the UC schools. And there are various different postback programs. We can talk about this if people have questions, but the UC one, it's obviously for the UC schools. I applied basically across the board and um, uh, UC Irvine ended up uh, selecting me, and which was cool because I was from Irvine. I was like, all right, Irvine, it is. I graduated in 08. I did the post back in 2010. And for me, um, I had already taken the MCAT. So the post -bac program does come with an MCAT prep component where towards the end, you, usually you basically prepare for the MCAT and you study for the MCAT. So it was a little bit different for me. Um, I started that program wanting to obviously do all that I can to put myself in the best position possible. And I was instructed on how important it was for me to be very selfish about my time, which I know is very hard, for, especially for people from our communities, black and brown communities, as I mentioned, um, because, they're, you know, family is not that family is not important to everyone else, but family, you know, it's just a different, I don't know how to explain it. It's just different, right? Like you go to birthday parties, you go to holidays, you're going to doing things at parks and pool parties and summer things and all these different things. There's a lot of things that are trying to pull, you know, to, trying to detract, distract us and take our attention away from what's what we need to do. And so I had to tell my family and tell everyone like, look, I need to do this, 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 I have to do this because, and I tell people this all the time, if you don't help yourself first, it's hard to help other people. And that's the same thing for medicine. We're learning now that obviously there's a lot of people who are going through a lot of things from an emotional, psycho, psycho, psychological standpoint. If we don't help ourselves, it's going to be really hard for us to help our, our patients. Understanding that the system obviously has a lot of issues. And I don't, again, that's something else we can go into. But in terms of the post pack program, I had to, to first be very selfish with my time and really sure, made sure that this opportunity, I didn't waste it because this was gonna be not the last, but one of the big opportunities that I had to potentially prove to medical programs, medical schools that I can handle a med school curriculum. So I did the post back program. Um, they completely changed my way of thinking and my approach to obviously preparing for uh, exams and doing what I needed to do to be successful on my exams. Because I was a bio major, which most people who go and do the UC post -backs are coming from bio degrees or having pre-med backgrounds. Um, there are some programs that are for people who don't have pre-med backgrounds, but I basically had to take all upper division bio classes, which are the ones that typically we all like run away from. We don't want to take those. I don't want to do advanced biochemistry, advanced molecular biology, you know, advanced uh, this and that. I mean, it's just those are the ones where people were afraid of. Um, and they, they just basically took the core ones and try to like cherry pick the easier ones just so you can, you know, we all know the game, do what you need to do to, to, to be successful and get out of there. But I ended up taking all advanced level bio classes because I had already taken a lot of the lower division ones. And there were a few that I did that I got lower than a, you know, a C in, but when he, anytime you get a C or above, you can't repeat that class, right? You have to then take, take other ones. And so um, I took a lot of advanced classes. I took, you know, uh, anatomy and, and this and that. And I actually ended up finishing that program, um, basically getting all A's and one B plus. So I did really well. Um, and we did really well as a group collectively, we made it such that we were not in competition with anyone else, like in terms of our cohort, but we were going to try and do better than everyone else in the class. You know, obviously we weren't trying to gun or make anyone uncomfortable, but that was our mindset. We are as a group going to, to do very well. And so we all did fairly well. Um, we finished the post -bac program. Again, I didn't have to take the MCAT because I already took it. And, and for the, um, the med schools, it wasn't like I scored in the 95th or 99th percentile, but I did enough to prove that I can actually, the, the point is like, can you actually be successful? Are you someone that's you know, going to be able to handle med school curriculum? Are you gonna be someone that may not be able to pass their exams in med school or, or their boards? Like that, they, they, they felt with my score at the time, which the scoring system is very different now, um, I, I, I did enough. And so uh, we all were sitting down together and I, I applied, I applied, not everyone did, but because some people waited a year, but I actually applied that year because I, I, I actually had uh, good enough grades in the program, even though we weren't completely done yet. And you know, the way the applications open up, uh, if you wait until July, it's a little too late. So I applied 
with basically, you know, four quarters and, and UCs. I applied with the fall and winter quarter. And I don't think the spring quarter grades were out yet. Um, and, and then we did the summer before, because we actually started in the summer. So I had three quarters. Um, I applied with those grades and my MCAT and um, the UC Irvine Dean of Admissions advised me to apply to Irvine. Um, and so I applied to Irvine. Um, she didn't tell me, you know, no guarantees. Like you have to go through the entire process like everyone else. Everyone gets reviewed, everyone interviews, you know, I can't just like shoo you in, right? Um, but at the end of um, our, our uh, cohorts year, um, we were all sitting down together. I'll never, I'll never forget this. We were all sitting down together. We we're talking, like sort of enjoying our time. And she walks right in front of me and puts an envelope right in front of me. And she's like, open this up. And I opened it up. And that was my acceptance letter to med school. Um, it's just giving me chills right now, just thinking about it. And so, um, you know, she is very protective of her post back students because she wants us to do well again the goal is not to just get into medical school the goal is to get into medical school and do well in medical school so that you don't drown and suffer and you know end up having to deal with a lot of things that we deal with in terms of imposter syndrome and doubts and you know maybe wanting to quit and so typically um before me there was a time when people would go right from the post back program into med school but we actually have this this now program that basically allows you to split the first year into two years so you're not quite in medical school yet, but you are in medical school because you're taking class with the medical school, but you actually have to do well. There's a lot of tutoring that's involved with this and whatnot, but you have to do well in that first year. And they split it up to give you an opportunity to really focus and do as well as you can. And then at the end of that, if you do well, then you'll be fully accepted into medical school that following year. She let me go right in. She believed in me enough. Um, they believed in me enough that they didn't think that I was going to have an issue. I didn't have to do that program that basically, you know, the, the two years are split in, in, into one. And um, I went right in. And obviously me wanting to show them that, that they didn't make a mistake. And, you know, again, this, this, this sometimes is how we think. We end up ultimately putting more pressure on ourselves and on our shoulders than we need to. But that's just the life of being a black and brown person, especially when you're in med medical school and you don't see a lot of folks that look like you. But I wanted to show them that this wasn't something that, was a mistake and that they they made the right choice. So um, I ended up, you know, we can talk more about like kind of what happened during medical school, but I ended up finishing in the top 25% of my class. Um, I honored some of the classes, did well. I was an anatomy tutor because I, I loved anatomy so much, did so well in anatomy that I actually was one of the tutors for the, pre, the next class. So basically you finish and then the next year the, the professor takes three or four students and they become the course tutors for the, for the next class. And I did that. Um, I was very active in diversity efforts, um, was on the admissions committee and group at, you know, as a medical student, we did a lot of stuff for, for the underrepresented uh, applicants that were coming in to try and improve our numbers at Irvine, did a lot of outreach in the community, did some stuff at, at, uh, in Long Beach at an elementary school out there, um, where we took students out there to, to try and uh, spark their interest in medicine. And then various different other things involved with the SNMA. Um, I was one of the chairs for UC Irvine. Um, and so from, from there, I ended up, I started off wanting to thinking that I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then I thought maybe just a general surgeon, cause I really love surgery. OB, I liked a lot, liked gynonc, but then ultimately decided on anesthesia. Um, we can talk more about that and, uh, match at Stanford, as you guys found out, did my intern year at UC Irvine. Stanford was my first choice. I was very, very happy and, you know, felt very blessed to be able to, to, to go there because it was different from my prior experiences. Everything was UC in Southern California. And so my mentors were trying to think that, trying to, to, to tell me that I, I should look elsewhere, which I did um, and ended up at Stanford. And my wife and I, girlfriend at the time, we got married um, after my intern year. And then we went up to Stanford and, um, and then I finished at Stanford, uh, very active in various different things there. We can talk more about what I did there. Did my resident our fellowship sorry at cedars during the middle of the pandemic in 2020 was really stressed about taking boards took my boards i passed my boards both the oral and written boards um and so i'm a you know assistant professor so crazy to say at, at ucla now which is my dream institution where i wanted to go for undergrad they denied me twice and now i'm actually a professor there helping to try and uh bring bring um you know more folks than look like me into to the medical school and and into our residency program so that's just a little bit about myself. I have a son now. He's 16 months. Um, uh, there are various different other things that I like to do outside of medicine, which we talk about that in terms of life balance. But that's just a little bit about my path to medicine, how I got to where I am today. Um, and now we can 
talk about whatever you guys want. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys follow along and, 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 um, you know, you found that to be in, inspiring. Um, some of the people put in there in the chat where they're from and things. I think the first question is, um, how did you decide? A lot of people want to know about the MD MBA and how did you come about doing that and how, what was the process? Sure. Yeah, I'm just look, quickly looking here. What's up, Nelson? Thanks for all that you do. Works in hospice. That's great. Haley student at American River College, interested in PhD, cool. Destiny, nice to meet you. Major in psych, my mom's psych, like I said, my wife is psych, my brother's psych. Isaiah, Santa Monica College, okay. Nice, a lot of people go from Santa Monica College to UCLA. <laughs> um, Ashley Woodland, what's up Ashley? Jonathan, Kylie, cool. Well, nice to meet you all, Abood, a lot of people here, cool. Um, Veronica. Uh, so for me, uh, again, we have a lot of people, a lot of folks in my family, my, my mom, uh, my grandmother, other people. We have a lot of small businesses, um, a lot of family members and are entrepreneurial. And so I grew up knowing that I wanted to be a physician, but I also know I wanted to, wanted to be an entrepreneur as well. Um, very intrigued by business. Medicine is very frustrating. The business side of medicine is very, very frustrating. Um, as you move along, you're kind of like, shielded from a lot, but you hear about how all the frustrations that exist and, and, and whatnot in terms of like um, payers and, and the, the infrastructure and, and operationally kind of how we do things. It's just a mess. I mean, a lot of folks come in from the outside and are just like, how in the world does this work? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so for me, you know, there's a lot of discussions about kind of how can we fix medicine? Um, how do we bring medicine from where it is to where we want it to be, um, you know, from many different angles. And I knew I wanted to be a part of those discussions. Um, I'm also very fascinated by technology, as, as you heard, and, and whatnot, and various different other things. And so I know that um, I knew that uh, from my experiences in medical school, we don't get taught a lot about a lot of things in business. And when you come out from, from this, you're expected to be a leader. When you put on a white coat, whether you want to be or not, it's like basketball players, this whole discussion about our basketball players or our football players or our athletes, uh, leaders. The answer is yes. Um, you may not want to be one, but you are. People are looking to you as an example, as an exemplar person. Is it fair? May not be, but that's just the reality of the situation. They look to you um, as a leader and you're leading other people. And so, yes, you are a leader. For us in medicine, we come out of this, you're going to be expected to you know, lead your healthcare teams, whether it be you and nurse practitioners, nurses, medical assistants, you and trainees, like medical students, residents, fellows, uh, you're going to be leading a, a group of individuals and helping obviously pull the best out of everyone and collectively the group as a unit so that we can actually do the best for our patients in terms of, you know, the care that we deliver. And then obviously, you're expected to have an understanding of things like finance and 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 the financial uh, um, sort of structure of medicine. Because yes, we are all most hospitals, if not all hospitals, are not, not for profit. But you know, we obviously generate money and and revenue, and we need to be profitable and productive so that we can continue to do what we do. Um, you know, to treat our patients, but also so that we can uh, you know make an income and support our families. So we don't get taught any of this stuff in medicine, really. Um, you learn some of it. They, you know, there are definitely some lectures we had in residency about the, the, uh, the business side of anesthesia and you know, talks about going into private practice or academia, but in healthcare, sorry, in medical school, uh, you get very, very little of this, very little of this. And so at Irvine, that was one of the institutions, not everyone has, has this because you have to have a business school and a medical school to have the MD, MBA program unless there's partnerships or relationships with you know, schools outside of the institution where you're doing your medical training. But at Irvine, we actually have a medical school and we have a, have a business school. So we actually have a five-year MD, MBA program where now I think it's four years because they realize for medical students, you know, ones who are basically only interested in healthcare management, you could do a one-year program and get everything that you need. I'm so thankful that I actually still had the five-year program, three and a half years of medicine, 
one and a half years of business. So it's kind of truncated a little bit. You got to move a little bit faster. But I did a full MBA. So I was exposed to everything. I was exposed to marketing. I was exposed to finance. I was exposed to accounting. I was exposed to organizational management, which I love, um, which has to do with marketing and and uh, culture, community, teamwork, um, sort of a whole bunch of other softer things, but really important things. Um, um, and uh, diversity, like you know, Jedi or, or, or equity. Um, I did that, uh, and I and I took advantage of that. I really tried to not just do the healthcare focus classes, but just wanted to really immerse myself in and do everything. And so um, I wanted to to come out of medical school um, really positioned well to be able to you know um, take on a leadership position in medicine. I have goals of wanting to be a healthcare executive, um, and those are lofty goals, but that's you know what what I'd like to do. And I also want to be very involved in various different other aspects of medicine, whether it be community outreach or being involved with local and national groups that work on things like, um, uh, you know, uh, advocacy and and uh, helping our politicians sort of create laws um, that are helpful for us and our patients. Right. Um, so that's why I wanted to do it. That's why I wanted to do it. Um, and so the year that I actually applied my year. There were actually 20 of us, which is a lot. There are only 100 um, business students per class at Irvine. And they never want one group to, to dominate more than another. So there are five uh, people in each small group. Again, it's a small group kind of a format. So you can't have more than 20 of anyone. So if you have a whole bunch of people who are coming in from, from tech or from marketing background, they can't have you know 20 plus people because they want to make sure that they're, they're, the groups are very... Uh, dynamic and diverse and so that the discussions that we have are very good so that you can actually be you know um, exposed to different viewpoints and ideas from people who come from various different walks of life and do various different things um, that's obviously how you end up uh, growing and evolving as a person so 20 people had already applied I applied late the reason why I was able to do it thank God is one person actually backed out and I was on the wait list and they let me in thank God because otherwise I would have been out of luck so I made the decision late and so I ended up doing it and um, now, you know, there's, there's, there's discussions that people have about whether or not you should do it when you're in medical school or do it after. And if you're going to just focus on using your MBA for healthcare management or medicine, there, there is an argument that maybe waiting until you are actually in practice and have done it for a little bit, that might be a better approach than doing it right when you're a medical student, because you have really little experience. And it's, in terms of, you know, it's applicability, being able to apply what you learn. It's a little bit more challenging because you go from medical school to residency and you go from residency to potentially fellowship and then from fellowship then to practice. But that being said, the business school still, like the, the MBA allows you to sort of see the world in a very different way. It exposed me to things that I would have not been otherwise exposed to in medical school. And I, I actually was able to figure out, you know, from the discussions I've had with people along the way, how I can sort of keep that side of my brain or sides of my brain active so that I actually didn't lose touch with my MBA background. So my program director at Stanford happens to be an MD MBA. My, one of the guys that I was really in, um, uh, involved with in terms of the things that he does did at Stanford as well. He's our VP of operate OR services. I don't know if his title has changed, but at the time he was the person who was in charge of all the ORs. Dr. Sam Walt, he's a pediatric anesthesiologist, um, was at UCLA for a while. He's also an MD, MBA. So I kind of gravitated towards various different people, not just at my institution, but all across the nation who had MBAs and backgrounds in business and, and tried to figure out if there are projects that I can work on or just maybe just be a fly on the wall when they had meetings and discussions so that I can actually um, see how they navigate you know, their various spaces in medicine and do the things that they do to sort of help sort of um, keep, the, keep the ship moving. Um, here at, at uh, UCLA, uh, one of my faculty mentors, which everyone has to have mentors, you don't just stop having mentors, um, even the older faculty, more senior faculty, everyone needs to have mentors. My fa one of my faculty men mentors is the chief medical officer at Santa Monica Hospital, and, uh, UCLA Santa Monica in Santa Monica. And so, um, yeah, that, that's why I ended up doing it, really wanted to be involved in the business side of medicine, and really wanting to have impact and making sure that I'm not just like having impact at, at, you know, in terms of like, you know, patients, what we do for our patients, but I wanted to have impact outside as well in terms of like 
how this 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 system is going to evolve over time, knowing that I'm just like one small piece of the puzzle, very, very small piece of the puzzle again. Um, but that's why I did it. That's why I did it. So I have a I have another question. Um and you mentioned you touched on it a little bit. You said that in in a lot of spaces that you are from undergraduate to even where you are currently being the only person of color, um, how do you how do you address that or how do you not feel out of place or um, you know not being like everyone else around you? Yeah, so imposter syndrome. Let's just talk about that first. I give a couple of uh, um, talks. I've given a couple of talks on, on imposter syndrome to various groups, the SNMA a couple of times to their AMAC and one of the regional um, meetings with my buddy, Adam, Adam Milan, Dr. Milan, uh, who's also an anesthesiologist. Imposter syndrome is something that every, many, not everyone, but lots of people uh, deal with, um, especially people from, from um, minority backgrounds. Um, we've always been told that we have to do more than everyone else. We have to prove that we're better than everyone else and, and, and uh, to be as good as everyone else. Um, we have to work harder than everyone else. Um, and, you know, when you look around, you just don't see a lot of people who look like you. You don't maybe know a lot of people in the community who, have, who are on this path that want to, you know, be a physician, a lot of first gen, obviously. And there are historical reasons for this. Uh, we were excluded from medicine for a while. We were excluded from societies, the AMA, the American Medical Association, recently admitted to their atrocities and, and, and not doing enough to help, um, you know, black and brown folks um, integrate into medicine. And so the National Medical Association was started because we were not allowed to actually be members of the Medical, Medical Association. We have our own medical schools, which Drew now has a, 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 they've always been associated with UCLA or for a while they've been associated with UCLA, but now Drew has their own medical school again. So they'll actually have their own medical students um, that they're gonna graduate as, as you know, as now back to being a, um, you know, one of the uh, few programs out there, you know, Drew, Howard, Harry, um, that actually have uh, uh, historically black colleges that actually have um, medical schools. So that those those obviously were were designed, or the hope was to actually help, help sort of bring more more of us in. Um, but me going to obviously Sierra Vine, which is not a predominantly um, you know uh, black college um, or historically black. Uh, uh, university. Um, yeah, I mean, when I got there, there just weren't a lot of people who looked like me. And I, I went to Irvine. I know how it is. I mean, at Irvine, there were less than 3% students who were African-American. Um, when you look at medical school, the numbers aren't great. When you look at anesthesiology, the numbers aren't great. I mean, in, in medicine, 5% of doctors, six, five, six percent of doctors are black and, and, and anesthesiology, 3%. So that, that makes it really tough. And when you struggle, you start having doubts and wondering if you're good enough or wondering if you made a mistake. Again, imposter syndrome, not sure who to talk to, afraid that you, you, know, you can't reach out to people. People don't relate to you. People don't, don't know where you're coming from. People don't understand maybe some of the things that you've gone through. And that's, like, that's with everyone, but it, it seems to just be something that we really internalize and really you know, uh, deal with in, in ways that make it very challenging to see the success that you're looking for. Put a lot of pressure on, on ourselves. Um, and so for me, the way I navigated that space is one, a lot of places have community with individuals who are from these backgrounds, or at least try to build that community where even if it's just a few of us, we really try to come together. I know LMSA, the Latino Medical Association at, at UC Irvine, um, very much so had a very strong community and they had tutoring sessions and various different things to help um, you know, all of us um, do well. And the Student National Medical Association was another uh, 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 means to sort of bring everyone together, trying to, to connect with um, minority uh, physicians at UC Irvine um, who could mentor us and help figure out how we could, you know, be, be well positioned to do well. Um, and then being involved with various different groups outside of the institution helped me out as, as well. I was with the Drew Society, which is um, a subset of the NMA. I used to go to their meetings. There are a lot of you know, black physicians who are in this society and connecting with them um, and really trying to do the best that I could to, to you know, have good mentors. Mentorship is very important. Um, but I also have to be very honest when I struggled or had issues, um, when I needed help, 
really just sort of taking a different look at tutoring and understanding that tutoring is not just for people who are, and I say this, no offense to anyone else, but this is how you think when you're younger, tutoring is for people who are stupid or dumb that don't know how, that, that aren't smart, you know, that don't know how to, to do something. And so they need help. I had to, we, we all have to change our outlook on things. That's not, that's told, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, people go to tutoring and use it as another study session. I didn't really understand that. So I got to my postback program. It's just another way to see the material, another way to just sort of see where you're at and understand kind of what you may need to focus on. And really, it helps you understand what the professors are focusing on. Because when you go to their office hours and tutoring and all that stuff, you know, it really helps you understand what they're hoping you understand. And a lot of times what comes out of their mouth ends up on the test. And so I really like, you know, had to understand how to navigate the space, how to play the game, what I needed to do to be successful. So, um, you know, mentorship, huge. Being honest about my where I when I needed help and not waiting to the end, you know, you know, being humble, huge. Not putting too much pressure on myself, not trying to be the person from my community that was going to be the one that, you know, did everything for everyone, carried the weight of being the one to be successful so that everyone can see that I made it. Um, I had to try to really do the best I can to not put too much pressure on myself. And we all do, because we all deal with those things. And so it's still something we all deal with. Um, even to this day, people still deal with imposter syndrome. I still sometimes have doubts and I have to be reminded that, you know, it wasn't by accident that I got here, that, you know, that I'm, I'm smart enough that um, I've, I've paid my dues and I'm still paying my dues that I've done what I needed to do to be successful. I passed my boards, you know, you know, you still have to deal with these things. Even at, Irvine, at UCLA right now, um, there's not a whole bunch of people in my department who look like me. And our chair recognizes that. And the people in our department recognize that. And we're trying to do the best we can to build community and make sure that we have what we need. Everyone has what they need, but particularly we have what we need, um, the support we need, the resources we need to be successful. So, um, you know, no one gets anywhere in life by his or her or themselves. No one. We all need someone. Um, and needing someone doesn't mean, again, that you have some sort of uh, disability um, that you, you know, you, you, you're unable to do it because, you know, something is wrong with you. No, it's, it's, it's just that you can only go so far by yourself, right? You need sponsors, you need people to help push you along and, and help honestly keep you humble, that are keeping you focused, making sure that you share your goals with people so that when time comes, if you have doubts or whatnot, they could just pull their receipts out and say, hey, remember you said this? Remember you said you wanted to be a doctor? I get that things change and you may change your mind, all this stuff. But what you're telling me is that it sounds like you're you're doubting yourself because of fear or something else, not because like you've tried and you've exhausted all your options and, and whatnot, and you realize that you know it's just not for you. So keep pushing, keep going. You know that that those words of encouragement, everyone needs that. And so that that's how I was able to get through. You know, just to really just it it, it takes a community, right? It, it takes a village, as they say. It's not just not just you, and um, so that's how I was able to do it. Um, and that's why I'm here. That's why that's why I'm here to make myself available to make sure that I can help others who look like me. Um, now that that door has been open, come through the door as well. So we have a couple questions in the Q and A section. Um, the first one is from Kylie, and they want to know when did you decide that you wanted to be an anesthesiologist? When I was doing my MBA. Um, again, I went. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my problem is I like I liked a lot of different things. And it's really hard when you like a lot of different things because, you know, you have to decide within two, three years, like what you want to do. And that can be kind of scary um, for people because, um, you know, you may come to the end and you're like, I don't know what I want to do still. But for me, fortunately, I went through my rotations and I tried to keep a very open mind. You know, I knew I liked surgery and ortho, but I really wanted to keep a very open mind. I didn't want to close off my mind from thinking that potentially other opportunities weren't, weren't, weren't going to be good for me because if I did that, um, I might have missed out on potentially my calling or my, you know, what, what I thought was going to be what, what, what may have been the best road for me. And so I went through, I liked medicine. I liked OB. I liked everything, but you know, and it's not that I don't like peds. I love kids. I love my son, but I just, I just, you know, that was a tough one for me in terms of seeing sick kiddos. I, I just couldn't do it. Um, but I liked a lot of that. I love psychi psychiatry. Um, I spent a lot of time working with psychiatrists, um, after undergrad, but at the end of the day, couple of my buddies um when i was like finishing up those first couple of years and getting ready to start the mba program a couple of my buddies basically who were ahead of me went into anesthesia and they're like hey you're you're just like us <laughs> you like a lot of things that we like you should take a look at anesthesia i think you'd like it and i was like uh i don't know anything about anesthesiology but 
okay. <laughs> and so I ended up um, meeting an anesthesiologist at UC Irvine who, who has a dual degree as well, MD, MBA, um, really cool guy. Um, and I shadowed him. And also when I was on my surgery rotation, anesthesiologist brought me to the other side of the curtain when there wasn't a lot going on on the surgery side. I would, you know, they were like, hey, you want to come over here and see what we do over here? And the surgeon's like, you can go over there if you'd like. So they let me over there. And that was their bad because they ended up attracting me, you know, pulling me in and, and I never kind of went back. But I, I ended up realizing that for me, anesthesia was, was what I was looking for. I wanted to be, do something that was very procedural, but also had medicine, which we have a good balance of both. I'm in the operating room with, with surgeons, which I like, although I'm not doing surgery myself, but I'm working with them. I'm also working on the L&D floor doing labor, and, uh, sorry, OB anesthesia, which is great because I, I really did like OB, but now I get to actually help with pain management and just helping the experience, helping, you know, laboring individuals with the overall have a better experience. Um, I can work in the ICU, I can do pediatrics, and as a regional anesthesiologist, acute pain doc, I literally could be anywhere in the ED doing nerve blocks and, you know, doing blocks um, in our community hospital, our community, sorry, uh, outpatient surgery centers and our hospitals. I mean, it's just the anesthesia and the anesthesiologist has the ability to basically be anywhere in the hospital doing any number of different things. And also very much so involved in leadership. I found that a lot of anesthesiologists that I worked with, um, and it could just be, be, you know, like, like attracts alike. Um, but I just um, found that a lot of anesthesiologists were involved in hospital administration and working with committees and doing a lot of leadership things, which I found really cool because that's what I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, at the end of it, I ended up deciding on anesthesia and here we are. The next question is from Abood and um, you mentioned earlier that you were quite active. What exactly were you doing? And then how did you balance that out with medical school? Yeah. So in medical school, like I mentioned, I was involved with recruitment. I did some admission stuff as a medical student. Um, and um, I also did outreach. We have outreach groups. Um, I was a, like the, the president or chair of our, our school's SNMA chapter, did that for a few years. Um, I did some work out in the community with uh, uh, mobile clinics. Um, I did a little bit of research, not a whole lot, but I did some anesthesia related research with some of the anesthesiologists at UC Irvine. Um, and I did, I did ortho research between first and second year because I, was, I really thought I wanted to go into orthopedics. So that summer, I spent the whole summer doing ortho research. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, you, you, you have to find a way. It's, it's tough. You know, it gets very busy for sure. Med school, like they say, is like, you know, opening a fire, fire you know, water hose from a fire hydrant. And, you know, you're just consuming information really, really fast. It comes at you very fast. But you learn how to make adjustments along the way. You have a lot of resources. No one wants you to fail. You have a lot of resources at your you know, disposal to do well, from office hours to tutoring to various different things. I studied a lot with friends in medical school. We did group sessions, kind of like bounce things off each other, taught each other the material. You know, really that active learning, that's how you really like you know, obtain information. And so when I did all these other things, it was when I had time, you know, whenever I had time to do them in terms of like a free weekend or, you know, um, scheduling things or, uh, in, in a way that allowed me to, to not obviously have to do these things right around big tests or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you just find a way. You want to really find a few things that you're really passionate about and stick with them and really show people that you were invested in it, that's, that looks better than trying to get involved with a whole bunch of different things and really not being able to come away from it with a really like heartfelt experience. And so I, I, I just wanted to just like really stick to a few different things, which for me, outreach is very important. My work with the SNMA and some of the research things I did and, and you know, and also the admission stuff that was really important to me. Um, and also I did intramurals as well. We were very competitive. We actually ended up winning uh, the football championship, which is not something that happens all that often. Actually, I don't know if it ever happened for our med school, but we did. We won, uh, which we're really like, you know, proud of. Um, and so, yeah, you just want to stay active. You want you have to stay active. You know, you want to keep your brain active in various different things. You want to make sure you're well balanced and that you have that your interest, things that you're passionate about, you're still continuing to do in some capacity. Because if you go through the entire experience and all you're doing is medicine, although it's important to focus on your medical studies, you know, your medical school work, you have to focus on that because you want to do well. You can't only focus on that, though, because you won't have the balance that you need in order to be happy. And so um, I'm a religious person. I try to stay involved with my church community. 
try to just keep up with my family as much as I could, but I let them know if I, obviously if I couldn't keep up with them, there are things that I couldn't do. I had to be honest with, with them about that, try to travel and do things on my vacation weeks when I could. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's hard to say everyone's a little bit different. No one can tell you what you're passionate about. No one can tell you what you want or what you like, but you can share what you like and what you're passionate about. People can help you figure out how to like stay involved in those different things. And so that's what I tried to do. Try to stay involved in things that I was passionate with as much as I could. And it worked out. Um, so, but you, tr trust me, when you're a student and not a graduate student, lots of opportunities are going to be out there. Many things are going to be available to you. So if you want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. Um, if you don't want to do it and you just want to go through school, you could do that too. Although now, like the way things are looking in terms of residency, you want to come out with some, you know, uh, things on your CV that show that you did some stuff, not just study and, you know, and did medical school. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, it sounds crazy. It sounds daunting. I know a lot of things I'm saying, maybe kind of stressing some of y'all to be honest, if you're being honest with me, but don't be stressed out. Um, that's just the nature of it. You know, as you move along in life, things are going to get harder. You're going to start having kids. You're going to, if, you, if that's in your calling or card, you're going to have maybe a family and you're going to have job stuff that you have to worry about and, and home and cars and life doesn't get easier just because you get older, it gets harder, but it, 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 it gets fun. And you just have to navigate those challenges and find ways to do it and stuff. So, yeah. I think to build on that too, we have a lot of people that are still um, pre-med. So they yeah. were wondering, what are some of the extracurricular activities you did prior to starting medical school? Yeah. So when I was pre-med, I finished in 08. So it was a while ago. Um, and so I think first and foremost, the, the, the best thing to do is to keep up with people who are kind of just recently finished or maybe even still going through it. But just for me, sharing my experiences, you know, which were a while ago, it's a little different now, especially with everything being virtual for the last couple of years, for the most part. Um, I was in a fraternity. I was on a couple of various different, uh, I don't know if they'd call com committees, but I did some student uh, group things uh, on campus um, for the recreation center, for the student center. I was involved in various different um, ways where like, you know, they have the groups that come together and we kind of figure out. Uh, collectively as a body, like what we we're going to do um, for the year for that for for those for those areas of the of the uh, school, I did some outreach. Um, you know, I did do some research, um, and I was involved in various different things off campus as well. Um, did a lot of sports. You know, intramurals. Again, I'm a big sports guy. Did a lot of intramurals. Um, but yeah, I just I just found some things I was really passionate about again, and I stuck with them. Um, but if I'm being honest, again, we have to be honest, some of those things may have been pulling my attention away from my studies as well. So if you do really well in all these other things, but you don't do very well in school, then you have to ask yourself, okay, maybe I, should I potentially um, pull back on some of these things so that I can do what I need to do to be successful? Because although it's really important to be very successful outside of school as well, in terms of your community outreach, your community service, your research and efforts and various different other things that you may do, if you're not doing well in school, it's not going to help you. Um, it's not going to help you because obviously you have to have both in some way. Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, although I was fairly active on campus and I didn't just go to school and do school only, um, I still, I still needed to figure out how, what I need to do to be very su successful in my courses. And I didn't figure that out until much later. Fortunately, it didn't completely kill my chances from obviously being able to, to, to go down this path. Um, but yeah, you just have to be careful. Like again, it's, it's really a balance. Having mentors that can really help you navigate that about, you know, that space and figure out that balance. That's really important um, and stuff. So just find some stuff you're really passionate about and stick with it. I mean, there's some people who are musicians. They're going to medical school, but they're musicians. They're really good at being musicians. That's great. You know, people want to know what you are committed to. Um, it doesn't have to be all just research. Do a little bit of research or shadowing folks, very important if you can do that. But if you're like a, a, a really good cook or chef or like, you know, I'm very passionate about culinary space as well. If you're, you know, a musician. If you're someone who, um, you know, does a lot of community service, you're very involved in your church communities or whatever it is, like stuff that you do, like you want to be able to speak to those things in a way that shows passion and commitment. And that passion and commitment obviously can, can be influential in terms of, uh, you know, influencing people to believe that, that you'd be someone that they think that would be a, a good asset to their, to their organization. So. Thank you for that. 
Uh, we have another question. Somebody says you're very resilient and they were wondering if there was anything that you found surprisingly challenging about medical school and what you did to um, help you overcome that challenge. Yeah, no, medical school is hard. <laughs> Just being honest, it's hard. And fortunately for me, I grew up in Southern California. I went to UC Irvine. So I didn't have to figure out what life was like on a completely different campus in a completely different area. That was a privilege. And, you know, I'm very glad I had that experience because that's a completely different thing. When you start medical school and you're doing this and you're now having to relocate too far, maybe away from your family, because, you know, medical school is hard. Getting into medical school is hard. So you try and go where you get in. Right. You may not have the luxury of being able to choose from a whole bunch of different places and have options around home. Some people have to go far away to, to, to medical school, you know, completely other side of the country. One of my buddies who went to UC Irvine with me ended up going to uh, Albany, New York. And that's completely far away, obviously, from us. And so you just have to figure it out. And so for me, um, I, I didn't have that issue of, of being too far away from home. I didn't have the, un the unfamiliarity with, with campus because I was a UC Irvine undergrad. So I knew the campus really well. For me, it was just really the courses. The, they're hard. They're tough. They're challenging. It's a lot of material, like I said. Some of it, I was very happy I did the post -back. Not everyone needs a post -back. I don't want to come, you to come from this thinking that I need to do that too. Um, not everybody needs a post -back, but I did. And I'm glad I did because for me, my post -back classes, all those upper division advanced bio classes, many of them in the first year, I was seeing a lot of the material again because, you know, you go, you do biochem again in med school. You do um, molecular biology. You do uh, an anatomy. You do, you do, you do some, of the, some of the things again, but it's just now the med school uh, curriculum. And so I did those classes. And as I was going through the classes, when I had issues or struggles, I was, you know, made sure I, I talked to people. And I had, again, people in my class that had done the post back or in my med school had done the post back. So I was able to, you know, go to them. I found the community. I was able to go to them. I was able to, you know, go to the med, the med school, you know, people, the admissions folks who who brought me in because I knew them, you know, dean of admission, some of the other people who were involved with like sort of like counseling and whatnot. I was able to go to them and reach out to them. I went to re you know, reach out to my professors and try to like get extra time with them and go to their office hours and stuff like that. So, but that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of us. Again, it's hard. It's very hard. It's, you know, the people who go to medical school, obviously a lot of us, are very, you know, many, many are coming from places where they did really well and, and you know, really smart. And so you start, you try to not to compare yourself to other people, but that's obviously in the back of your mind as well. So I just really had to, um, you know, figure out what I needed to do and try not to compare myself to other people. And that's what I always tell people as well, in terms of like, when you're going through it, just really try to focus on doing me and not worrying about what everyone else is doing. Um, and, and that really helped a lot. So, but yeah, it's really hard to say exactly what your experience is going to be like and whether or not you're going to have a similar one to me, because chances are you probably won't. Everyone's going to go through it in very, you know, in different ways. Um, but, you know, I just can't speak highly enough of having good mentors and they're not just people who are much older than you. They're, it's like vertical mentorship and like horizontal, like people who are obviously going through the process with you can also serve as mentors, whether they're a year or two ahead or, you know, even in the same ranks as you are. Um, because we're all good at something. I was very good at anatomy. Some people are good at something else. And so I would reach out to other people who are maybe very good at that and have them help me figure it out. And when it came to anatomy, I was one of the tutors for anatomy. I can help people figure that out. Um, so yeah, that's just it. You know, community is really important. Mentorship is really important and being honest, being humble and about sort of your shortcoming is very, very important. That's how I was able to do it. And so like I said, sorry, not just that those things, but then also making sure that you actually are doing what you need to do to be successful, ridding yourself of distractions, trying not to have toxic things coming in, right? If things are draining you, if things are really weighing on you from a, from a mental standpoint, you have to figure out a way to distance yourself from those things. Very important. And that can be very hard to do because we're talking about friends and family and, you know, you love everyone and I still love, I loved everyone as well. But at the end of the day, if you don't do well, you can't come out of this and with the ability to help anyone. And so you, you're going to have to really make some tough decisions at times and, and really make sure that you do do well. And it can be very hard. 
very hard to be studying in the middle of the night on a weekend when your family is out doing something fun. That can be very, very hard. But, you know, four years of medical school, five if you maybe do a master's like I did, a little longer if you want to go the PhD route. At the end of the day, like when you're finished with this, what you're able to do and like the way you, you're able to represent your family and what you're able to do for patients and way, what I'm able to do for patients, especially patients from my community, you know, I don't look back and say, man, I wish I had gone out and done all those things, those couple of nights that I ended up studying and having to, to, you know, do what I need to do to be successful. It's all worth it. Um, is it perfect? No, definitely not perfect. But would I do it again? No, because I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> but yes, I would choose medicine again because I love it. And for the reasons I went in, the same reasons that I'm in, I would go in and do it again. So. Uh, you spoke a lot about mentorship. I was wondering, do you have any advice for the attendees on how to find mentors? Yeah, that's tough, especially right now, again, because of the way things have been going with the pandemic. A lot of opportunities have not been available to us in terms of being able to connect with people in person you know, shadowing and all that stuff. I think the the best mentors are the ones that kind of come organically. Um, like I have had assigned mentors and that works for sure. But for me, the best mentors are the ones where you basically either find someone who you look up to and you reach out to them and you like share your experiences, they share theirs and you guys come together or you just randomly happen to come and pair with someone who, just sort of evolves into your mentor. Um, you know, you can have more than one mentor too, not just, you don't just need one. And they could be people who aren't even in medicine. You know, they may be able to help you find people who are in medicine, but they're just helping you navigate life, right? So you need mentors in all kinds of different areas, you know, mentorship and finance, mentorship and health, mentorship and various different things. Um, and so I, I think, the best thing that I can say is if you have people in your area or people you see online or people you know who are doing things that you would like to do, reach out to them. The worst thing that anyone would say is no. And I know that kind of is fear that causes fear and anxiety to, you know, be rejected by, by someone. But you just get pick your, you know, move on and find go to, go to the next one. Because if you don't reach out and you don't make yourself available, you not make yourself vulnerable, then you'll never know. So you reach out to people and you say, hey, I was really inspired by what you do. And I really, I really, I really think I want to be an anesthesiologist. Do you think that you can, um, that I can maybe ask you some questions? You don't have to say, can I be a mentor? Just like when you go up to someone, I didn't tell my wife, like, hey, you want to be my girlfriend or my wife? And, you know, you don't need to go right, right there right away. Um, you know, I just want to say, hey, can I ask you some questions about how you, be, you know, what, what you went through or how you, you know, did what you did to become an anesthesiologist? And from there, you know, you follow up and from there, you follow up and from there, they may ask you what you're, what you're doing, where you're at. And then all of a sudden you're like building this relationship. And now that person, now that person is becoming a mentor and maybe they'll evolve into a sponsor, not just mentoring you, helping you navigate what you're going through, but helping you actually go walk through the doors that you need to walk through to get to the, where you need to be. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, reaching out to people is one way to do it. Um, as you go through and you, you find yourself engaged with people like this, or you're on social media following people, or you're being introduced to people in your programs, your pre-med programs, being involved in pre-med groups, very important, or med, med, med groups, being involved with groups like the SNMA or MAPS, LMSA, Latino Medical Association, AMSA, the, um, you know, the one for uh, Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, that's, that's how you can really sort of find people in your community who may be able to help you navigate this space. And if they are not able to, they may be able to open up their Rolodex and, and introduce you to people that they know. So yeah, that's, that's my, best, my, my best advice. Whenever you're doing anything, whether it be research, community outreach, community service, um, you know, whatever, when you're doing stuff, like try to figure out who's involved with these different efforts and whether or not they could be someone that could serve as a mentor. And if they cannot, maybe you can sort of, again, lean on them to help them, sorry, ask them if they can help you find, find mentors. Yeah. Just and then you can also ask the organizations that you're involved with um, or the schools you go to, do they have a formalized mentorship program? And again, I, it's not my favorite way of doing it, but it does help. And I have had mentors this way and it does work out sometimes. Um, but you can ask if they have a formalized mentorship program where they can connect you as well. So. 
I think we have one question, just a quick um, clarification between what is a mentor versus a sponsor? Yeah, I just mentioned it. So mentors and sponsors, so a sponsor can be a mentor, but a mentor is not always a sponsor. So a mentor is someone who's basically giving you advice or guiding you through whatever you're going through. So for me, my mentors, mentors for medicine may be sort of giving me advice about how to navigate the space of medicine, what I need to be, do to be successful as a medical student. How do I think about applying to residency or how do I strategically go about whatever? A sponsor is someone who can also could be a mentor, but they're also not just sort of giving you advice. They're literally get, picking up the phone. They're emailing people. They're like trying to figure out how to connect you with people who are able to make decisions that could be life changing for you. So that's like a completely different level of mentorship. They're not just giving you advice and guidance, which is great. They're also helping you actually get there by opening doors for you. And so I am very much so more interested in someone who's a sponsor. Uh, but sometimes you just need a mentor, someone, someone to just give you some quick advice, help you navigate something and then move on with your life. That's fine. But in terms of like really finding someone excuse me, who's going to be able to help you um, sort of advance along in your career. Someone who is a sponsor is, if you find someone like that, you want to hang on to them as, mu as much as you can, because that person is willing to go to bat for you and, and battle for you and to, to really help you um, reach your end goal and beyond, right? Because I've already gone through medical school now, residency and fellowship, so I'm done with my medical training. But now I hopefully, God willing, have a long life career uh, now that I need to figure out how to navigate as a junior faculty to mid-level faculty to a senior faculty. If I stay in academics, that's a lot of time potentially. Um, and so, you know, having people who are willing to open doors for you, which ha is happening right now, I have people who are involved in, in various different societies that I'm in and also at the campus that I'm at that are really trying to help introduce me to very different things that I could do with my, with my platform and my career in medicine. And that's what you want. If you can find someone like that, you're in good shape. And if you don't, don't stress out. This is not something that you, if I don't find a mentor by the next month, oh my God, I'm not going to make it. No. Um, again, these things, take these things take time. You may find someone who's, who you think is a mentor and they may not be the best mentor for you. And that's fine. You just, you don't really keep up with that person anymore because, you know, they weren't the best for you or someone was great for you, but just they're not the best. So they were really good for you for a season, you know, for a part of, of the journey, but maybe not the whole journey. That's great too. But you know, you get you get different mentors along the way. You may keep the same mentor, one mentor for the whole time. You know, just just keep your ears and eyes open. As I was saying with residency, when I'm going or, or medical school, when I'm going through my my clerkships and trying to figure out what I wanted to do as you know for residency, I kept my my ears, my brain, my mind, my eyes open to a possibility of me potentially going down uh, going down that road and be, and and becoming a pediatrician or becoming a whatever. I kept myself open to that idea. So you want to keep your ears and eyes open when you're meeting people or you're being introduced to people or situations, because you never know if that situation is going to be one that could potentially lead you to, uh, you know, a pretty good opportunity. And one of the questions we have is, what are some of the challenges of being an anesthesiologist? There are many. <laughs> There's challenges of being a doctor, period. I mean, right now we're in, still in this, but seems to be coming out of the pandemic. That's a major challenge. Um, I am someone that's all in patients' faces and manipulating their airways. This virus is a respiratory virus. So in the beginning, I was really, really stressful, especially because my wife, you know, I had some I had family members. My wife ends up getting pregnant, you know, and, and not really knowing what to do in that situation because this is pre-vaccine. Then now we have our son who's a baby now in the middle of, with all this, RSV is running around, flu, COVID. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, that was a big challenge. Being an anesthesiologist is a humbling thing. You know, typically we're called in, in crises and we're being asked to put fires out and to help, help people navigate crises. We're, we're you know, we're ones that, um, that really do, like we call the masters of, of resuscitation. So when it comes to patients who are at the end of life or patients who are in the OR, who obviously are being essentially put on life support. That's what we're doing, putting them under general anesthesia on the ventilator, monitoring their vital signs. But things happen in the operating room where you know you have to be able to respond. You may have a significant blood loss or surgeons, something may happen in the surgery where you know, our, our, our you know, attention is needed for, for emergent situation. 
um, or a person comes in in an emergent situation and we happen to take them back. Though those can be very challenging situations, very humbling ex experiences for us. Um, and um, so, I mean, that's just a few, but yeah, anesthesia is very humbling. It's very tough. It's very challenging. We have to figure out how to preserve our energy. I tell residents or medical students, if we're interested, we have to understand how to very much so be very protective of our energy because you don't want to lose a lot of what we call catecholamines or lose too much energy before these stressful situations because you won't have anything. <laughs> You'll be running on fumes. Um, so we really, I was really intrigued actually when I was interested in anesthesia, how calm, cool, and collected many of the anesthesiologists were that I met who were dealing with these kinds of situations that I'm talking about. They weren't cocky or arrogant. They were just calm when they were dealing with these things. While a lot of people were stressing out and acting, you know, maybe crazy, um, they seem to just be really have this resolve about themselves. They're very calm. And I found that to be really cool. I was like, who is that person? I want to be that person, <laughs> you know? coming into situations where patients aren't doing very well and having to figure out how to help them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's a very humbling thing to be an anesthesiologist, but you know, I love it because we do something different. We can do something different every day, so. So I have about maybe, I know we're supposed to go to 12.30, but maybe a couple more today. Um, there's a lot going on obviously with the holidays coming up, but we have a lot of family in town and, um, my family, we're all getting ready to go see Black Panther, just being full, fully honest. <laughs> I wasn't able to see it last weekend because I was on call. And so I missed the opening weekend, but we're getting ready to go see Black Panther. We had to drop my son off to have him be watched by some family friends. So I can probably answer a few more questions. Um, and obviously, I, I, you guys have my contact information. You have my social media. You know how to find me if you want to ask me anything further. But I just want to make sure that everyone knows that I can't stay all the way till 1230, maybe about 1215. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's totally understandable. Uh, we have a couple in the Q and A I'll try to go through quickly. Uh, because you've sat on admissions committees, would you be able to share some tips that would help enhance our candidacy for medical school admissions? Yeah, I talked about them just being well-rounded, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out how your application can stand out from, from, from many, right. Um, when you submit your application, you have a picture in your profile, but it doesn't really necessarily speak to you as you are able to. So you're trying to get to the point to where you can actually sit in front of someone and now show them who you are. Let that character, that charisma, you know, all those good traits and qualities that you have come out so that you can impress upon people that you're someone that would be great for their program. So in order to get there, you have to do very well or do decently well and show a good, good, a good trajectory of, of maybe you did start off a little rocky, but then by the end of it, you're able to figure it out. And that's, that, that shows that, you know, you're, you, you matured and you had improvement or you did decently well throughout, you know, there are different ways you did a post back like I did, but you want to do well enough in your core curriculum classes, bio classes, and your pre-med classes to show a med school admissions folk that you can do well in medical school. You can handle a med school curriculum. You want to do the best you can on your MCAT. A lot of things are becoming pass fail now. There's a lot of bias built in these things. A lot of things, a lot of reasons why I think that they are not the best indicators of someone's you know, successes or not, but they're what we have now. So while we're trying to work to fix the system, you have to still understand how to play the game. So you need to do well on your, on your MCAT. You need to have uh, a CV that displays that you are someone who's well-rounded. So you wanna show that you are involved in things, but that you are actually intimately involved in them. That you're not just listing things because you think that the med school wants to see that you did them. Just like check boxes. I did right research. I did this, I did that, great. But what did you get from it? And when I'm reading this, does this tell me that this person really had a, you know, experience that was, um, was uh, you know, life altering or, you know, super um, uh, meaningful to them? And if it doesn't read to that, it's not that you're not going to get in. It just, it doesn't differentiate you from someone else, right? And then obviously if you have shortcomings, um, or you had things along the way that were challenges. Don't be afraid to bring those up. Again, you're not making excuses. You're just showing people that you were able to fight through adversity and deal with some really tough stuff. And despite all the things that you experienced, you were still able to make it through. Maybe with a few bruises and bumps along the way, but you, but you still made it through and you still want this. That actually speaks volumes as well. So, um, you know, that, that kind of comes up usually in personal statements and stuff like that. Or, you know, there's maybe a, a section dedicated to um, hardships. And so 
yeah, that's 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 my recommendation. It's just as you're going through life and you're doing things, making sure that you're updating your resume along the way, having everything documented so you don't have to wait to the very end to put it all down on paper, and then making sure you write a little spiel about why you did it. So what you did, why you did it, and how was this experience meaningful? Like, what did I gain from this? Like, that's, that's what you're trying, trying to relate to people in that little short amount of space that you're given. So that would be my best advice um, in terms of trying to, like, you know, have your application look great. Um, and, and once you get to the point to where it's complete, submit it and just let it go. You know, let it go and just, um, you know, just sort of uh, figure out what you need to do after that. But, but yeah, just, just um, oh, I should have mentioned having people proofread it and having people sort of go through it is also very important. You don't want to have too many people because you have too many opinions, but having some people, like I had my dad, who's very good at, at writing. Um, and so he read and, and really uh, read my personal statement. It really helped me sort of like make it a more powerful statement. I had my mom and, uh, and like, a, like a few uh, people who are in, in medicine where my mentors read it. Um, and they read through my application to make sure it read well. That's important. So you don't want to just submit anything because you don't typos show that you are someone who's not, um, you're not, you're just, you're sloppy. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, right? Typos are okay to have one here or there, but like you have a lot of time to proofread this, you know, before it goes in. So you were literally want to make sure that it's, well, you know, if you proofread it, that you, that you really, um, that it speaks well to who you are. And, and it's like a standalone document. It doesn't look like everyone else's. A lot of it will look like everyone else's, but you're hoping that it looks a little bit different, enough different so that you can, um, you know, really have someone, you know, um, want to bring you in for an interview. And I think for our last question, if you just have any last pieces of general advice that you want to share with, um, with our pre-meds. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, um, medicine needs you. And I don't say that to sort of uh, bring more stress and anxiety and pressure, but I just want to say that like, we need you, your community needs you, your patients need you. So whenever you're thinking about it, if it's really on your heart, and it's really something you're passionate about. I always say this, and I, I kind of write this on my Instagram post, don't let anything or anyone tell you you can or can't do it. You can do it. It just comes down to how badly do you want it? Are you willing to go those extra steps that may be necessary? or go those extra, that extra mile that may be necessary in order to get there. When I think about adversity or shortcomings along the way, I, I look at them as, as um, um, so I'll give you a different email. That email is, is on my Instagram, but not that one. <laughs> when I look at uh, road bumps along the way, or, or sorry, adversity along the way, I think of them as, as speed bumps, not dead ends. Now there could be something that you did that is so egregious that that may just absolutely ruin your chances of becoming a doctor, of course. But most of the time when we first face adversity, there are ways to sort of uh, recover from that. But it just comes down to how badly do you want to recover from it and how far are you willing to go? So just keep going, keep pushing. Um, if you're someone who has doubts about whether or not you're good enough, you are. If you're someone that says, I'm not smart enough, you are. Um, you know, you'd be surprised of what you're capable of with the right opportunity. Um, you can use my Gmail or UCLA, but Gmail might be easiest. With the right opportunity, um, you know, sort of given to you, the right, the resources given to you, the mentorship given to you, you'd be surprised how, how well you can do um, and how far you can go. I know some people that had worse scores than I did and, and worse grades than I did in undergrad. And um, they were able to become orthopedic surgeons. And, 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 you know, they didn't get these, hem, you know, don't let outside pressures and what people are saying outside really impact you too much. Because you'll hear things and you may hear what I heard. Well, the only reason why you got in is because of affirmative action. Well, California hasn't had affirmative action since the 90s, first off. Um, oh, the only reason why you got in is because you're black and they want black people in. I was like, well, have you looked around in, in medical schools? Where are all these black people that are just getting in for being black? <laughs> there were like three people, four people in my class out of 100. In Los Angeles or Irvine. So I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, that doesn't happen. No one's just letting people in because you're this or that. So you got to be really careful um, to really not allow some of the negativity from the outside to impact you, uh, to affect your, you know, your, your spirit, your body, you know, your own, your know, well-being. Um, and so, um, yeah, just, just know that, that you're, you're meant to do this. If you want to do this, you can do this. If you want to do this, 
Uh, it may take a little bit longer, but a lot of people actually take this quote unquote non-traditional route. You realize the non-traditional route is actually more of the majority than the non the, the traditional route, which is really more of the minority. People take gap years. People do whole careers and come back. Like they'll go out and do nursing. They'll go out and do something non-medical related. And then sometime in their late 20s or 30s, decide to go to medical school. I had classmates in my, that were in their 30s. One guy who was in his 40s in my class. So um, it's never too late. Um, you know, it's, it, you, you can do it if you, if you really want it. Um, and just, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the process. It's tough. It's hard, but life is hard. If you want to be the best athlete in the world, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be an astronaut, if you want to do any number of things, it requires a lot of commitment and dedication. It requires you to say no to things. It requires your time and energy and efforts. No different. I think the problem with medicine though, is there's just a lot of frustration because the system is broken. We know this It's broken and doesn't work. Um, as currently constructed as well as we, we we think it should. And while we're trying to fix the system so that our patients do are, are, are obviously better off, but also for the for, for for us, you know, so that we, the providers, are better off as well because a lot of people feel burnt out and whatnot. Um, but as we work on that, um, you know, you can still come out of this experience with a very uh, positive experience as I have. Despite everything I've been through, I still, to this day, um, never, it never gets old to, to, you know, to have some of the experiences that I have in the hospital when I'm, when I'm dealing with people who look like me or, or hearing older people talk about how happy they are to see me doing what I'm doing um, and how proud of they are of me and, you know, family members echoing the same sentiments. You know, you realize that obviously this is bigger than me, you know, it's bigger than us. You know, this is something that obviously is, is a very, um, very much so a privilege you know, to be a physician is a privilege. And so keep on keeping on. You guys can do it. I'm proud of what you're doing. I'm really I'm happy to, to that this organization, you know, the Pre-Med TC, um, that you guys brought me out to be able to talk to your group. Um, I think what you're doing is great. And I think we need a lot more of it. And any way that I can help or any ways that I can be of, of, of a resource, I, I definitely want to try and make myself available. So good luck to you all. Um, keep going. Keep going. Don't give up. And um, yeah. Enjoy your Saturday. <laughs>